part 17 now last week i taught and finished on the seventh outstanding healing miracle of jesus from mark's gospel chapter 5 and we looked at verses 25 to 34 it's an amazing portion of scripture where we saw how so many principles of victorious living is found in that one act made by a woman who was suffering for 12 long years from a physiological problem and how she received her healing and it's so amazing because she did not let a lot of things put her down but she decided i'll get to jesus i will not go to the law i will go to the law giver himself and that's the blessing we have this morning i will not say the cloud is the limit or the sky is the limit for me the throne of grace is my limit hallelujah and i will enter into the very presence of god and i will enter into the very place where god himself dwells hallelujah the person of god himself will be my refuge and my strength and my comfort and my deliverance hallelujah now in continuing we are going to look at the eighth outstanding healing miracle of jesus and we are coming to the close of these teachings the eighth outstanding healing miracle of jesus that i was impressed to take and teach on is found in john's gospel chapter 9 which is the healing of a man who was blind from his birth john's gospel chapter 9 the healing of a man who was blind from his birth now there are a lot of unusual things in this portion of scripture but i'd like you to first write down a little bit about the gospel of john the gospel of john according to bible teachers is a gospel that is filled with what they call high christology that means you see a lot of christ the anointed one in his role as messiah in this gospel more than you will see in any of the other gospels high christology and it's amazing that this healing of a man who was born blind or blind blind from his birth occupies an entire chapter the entire chapter not a couple of verses and that's why it's important for us to see why this eighth outstanding healing miracle is so much more powerful to us because this chapter chapter 9 shows us a lot of things now this is the only miracle in the gospels in which the sufferer is said to have been afflicted from his birth write it down please in all the other gospels you read of someone who was suffering from something but the impression is they received it at some point of time in their life but this is the only place you will read of how this man was born with this seeing defect and this miracle is an outstanding example of the development between two things belief and unbelief belief in the man who was healed unbelief in the reaction of the pharisees who examined him and finally excommunicated him so two things belief versus unbelief now over and over again you have heard and seen and read along with me as we studied different healing miracles of how jesus specifically looked at people and said go your way your faith had made you whole your faith now wholesomeness like we have all already seen is based on faith that you express in god and in his ability to do something specific in your life but in this last healing miracle you see a development of how belief and unbelief works something develops that's why it takes an entire chapter for john anointed by the holy ghost to write about it so you, you and i can 
study it in our time and see how there is sometimes a process by which a person moves to a place where complete belief is established in his heart in an irrevocable way about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are three attitudes of men that you will have to pay attention to in this entire chapter. The first is found in verses 1 and 2. Now let me read it out. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Now the first attitude that you find is the attitude of the disciples. For them, this man was a subject for theological analysis. Were they entirely wrong? Well, let's look at it in their background. According to Exodus chapter 20 verse 5 and Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 and 7, the Bible itself tells us that the law affirmed that Jehovah would visit the sins of the fathers upon the children. Now, in talking about this, you find that the disciples were more interested in speculation than in ministering to the individual. And that's the tragedy with many people in the church today. Just the other day I was talking to a family and I was making mention of this. As long as it's someone else who's going through a problem, well, they must have sinned. Then all of a sudden, they go through a problem and they have no answer to give. Please follow. This chapter, chapter 9, is a very, very powerful chapter for us. It's a warning to every believer not to unnecessarily get involved in theological speculation when we are called to minister to an individual. Now, the second attitude is found in verse 8. The attitude of the ones who were close to the man, his neighbors. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, It's not this he that sat and begged. Now the second attitude of his neighbors that we are going to be looking at was, he was a beggar, an unproductive man, someone dependent on their goodness. A person who, did, who was not a contributor to the life of the community, rather someone who lived off the community. So what was their attitude? Indifference. Indifference. And finally, you see the third attitude is of the Pharisees. Verse 15. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Now, the Pharisees were more interested in not hearing about the miracle. What they were interested in was in using the man as a tool to give witness against Jesus. That's the reason why they were questioning. If a man was really hungry for God and he saw something spectacular happen as an act of divine intervention... Anyone in their right senses would have fallen down and worshipped God. Not the Pharisees. The Pharisees was looking, were looking for a tool. Someone who would stand as a witness against Jesus. But in contrast to these three attitudes, you see the attitude of Jesus and this attitude has never changed. That's the good news. Look at Jesus. We're going to read verse 1 again. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. What was the attitude of Jesus? He saw a man. Not a sinner. Not a beggar. Not a witness or a tool. He saw a man. A person who needed his ministry. But his disciples saw differently. They saw a theological debate in the man. Who sinned? He or his father? 
or his mother. There must be sin behind this. What they didn't understand was that they were sinners, having lost the glory of God, standing before the righteous one, the last Adam. They had never they, they didn't see their sin. They didn't see their father's sin. Somehow, stir up to find out what sin did that man or his parents do. Now look at verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now over and over again, people have read this verse. Verse 3, And have landed in a place of confusion. But I want to read verse 4 out to you and show you something that will help you understand what Jesus was really communicating. We are not reading meaning into the verses. We are just reading it as it is. Okay? I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now, often these two verses have been read. And misunderstood to mean, please write it down, that this man was born blind for one purpose. For God to come in the person of Jesus and to heal him at that point of time. Now if you go by that kind of an interpretation, you have a problem. The problem is this. God permitted a man to suffer for so many years unjustly just to reveal his healing power. And that contradicts the nature of God. That contradicts the purposes of God. That contradicts the good God that you see in creation in Genesis chapter 1. Understand it well. Verses 3 and 4 often is misunderstood by people. They read it, they think, well, the father, the mother didn't sin, but that the works of God. So, this man's sickness was a sickness that God had permitted for him to go through so that Jesus would come and show off the power of God. No. No. Listen. When you look at Greek manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts in the New Testament were all written in Greek, but they were written in uncial letters. That means large rounded characters were used to write Greek. There was no separation between the letters, no punctuation, all division of the text into sentences, clauses, phrases were dependent on the judgment of the editors, the ones who were translating and putting down what was translated from the Greek into the English or into some other language. The punctuations were included by them the way they understood it and even divided into different sentences and clauses. Now, if that is so, then you must understand what was the purpose behind verses 3 and 4 and why in Breaking it up into verses 3 and 4, we have a problem. You don't have a problem if you read it just like that. I'm going to read it to you, please. In fact, if you will only look at the clause beginning in verse 3, the word but, detach it from that clause and attach it to verse 4, you will find the entire entire tenor of what was spoken is different. Now I was studying this and I'd like to give you out, give you the Greek verbatim translation of this verse as referring to the interlinear King James Version by George Ricker Berry. So I'd like to give you the verbatim Greek translation. It may sound a little funny but it's clear. Answer Jesus Neither this man sin nor parents his. Now that's verse 3. But that should be manifested the works of God in him. Me it behoves to work the works of him who sent me 
while day it is, comes night when no one is able to work. That is verse 4. In fact, verses 3 and 4 is not talking about the man's sickness at all. Verse 3 and 4 is talking about the works of God versus the works of the devil. The works of God is healing. The works of the devil is the sickness. The contrast is between the works of God and the works of the devil. Not because the man or his parents had sinned, this is going to happen. No, 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 no. That's not what God was trying to communicate. He was trying to show the disciples through the words of Jesus what the works of God were in comparison to what the works of the devil was. So what is ca called the works of God? What Jesus was shortly going to do? Not the sickness. Not the sickness. Now the word works in Greek is the word ergon. E-R-G-O-N. Ergon. There are scores of meanings for this verse or this word. But some of the most useful ones for us are these. It means toil, occupation or course of action. Toil, occupation or course of action. Now Jesus was standing there telling the disciples, don't get involved in a theological debate. Find out the works of God. Do it. Don't be sitting to find out and analyze sin because all are sinners. Fallen short of the glory of God like Romans chapter 3 verse 23 teaches us. Now look at verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now there are two very powerful things spoken in verse 4 and verse 5. In verse 4, you find Jesus referring to the works of him that sent him while it is day. So the word day is really talking about his messianic ministry. The night cometh. Cometh. It had not yet come. Talking about the crucifixion. The night is talking about his crucifixion. When no man can work. Now from verse 4 he moves to something else in verse 5. He says as long as I am in the world. I am the light of the world. Now he is not talking about just his limited time on this earth. But now he is moving to a deeper place. Where he is saying, I am the source of light. True illumination that dispels darkness. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Today is he still in the world? Yes, he is still in the world. That is why we are illuminated. Hallelujah! We have revelation because he is still the light of the world. He's still here. Still at work. That's why we receive revelation from God. Now, I want you to note the play on the word I am in verse 5. I am. Twice in verse 5, the word I am is mentioned. We shouldn't think that two words I am is just there to make sense in the grammatical construction of that sentence. No. How can we be so sure? Well, just look into the preceding chapter, chapter 8. The final conflict, you can say, that Jesus had with the Jews was on that one declaration that he made. What was the declaration? Before Abraham was, I am. And that really made them go through the ceiling. They took, then took their up stones to cast at him. They couldn't stand it. They couldn't stand him 
equating himself with Jehovah God. Now look at it here in verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Before light came into the natural, where was light? Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, it was in the one who is light. He spoke it and light was in this world. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 tells us, And God said, Let there be light. Why? Because light was in him. And when he spoke it out into the world, the Bible says light was. Now Jesus in verse 5 is equating himself with Jehovah all over again. Now I'm going to read a little bit this morning from the newsletter, May 2004. A couple of things that was written then that I think is very useful for us in our study of this particular healing miracle. Now, the newsletter, the pulpit for May 2004, in which I had written a little bit about the name of God. The article that I taught on was titled, Jehovah, the God of Divine Interventions. And I want you to listen very, very carefully. Because if you will, healing will never be a very out of the world experience for you. That somehow you can never have manifest in your physical bodies. But you will find, when you hear what I'm going to read out to you this morning, that healing is something forever settled in the heavens that you and I are called to have and to enjoy while we walk on planet earth. I'm reading from verse 6. Moses received a personal assignment from the Lord. He was to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. The assignment so frightened him that he began to give lame excuses. God did not accept them. And instead gave him a promise. Certainly I will be with thee. In fact. That is what we want to hear today. But the cries and lamentations of many over their miseries. Have kept their ears from hearing these reassuring words today. God's presence is a sure guarantee of success. When we accept a divine call. We must also claim divine help in a vain attempt to somehow circumvent the call of God on his life Moses wanted to know God's name because he said that the children of Israel were bound to ask him which God had sent him to them paganism and idolatry had somehow corrupted the mind of the Hebrews and Moses knew it but then God immediately did something. He gave Moses his name as I am. And in doing so revealed to Moses that he was, is and will always be a reality. He is a person eternal and unchangeable. Self-contained and self-sufficient. He cannot be explained or defined by anything outside himself. Quite obviously this name of God, I am, hitherto not revealed, was meant to convey to Moses, as well as to the entire nation of Israel, a new and precious revelation. It is full of meaning to us today, as it was to them then. And I want to share it with you. In Proverbs 18.10, like we sang a little earlier, in our worship service this morning. The Bible tells us. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. As we study the majestic name of God I am. He enables us to get a glimpse into his unmerited grace. You can't help but notice. That I am is an unfinished sentence. It has no object. I am what? 
It is marvelous to discover from the Bible that God in his mercy and goodness is saying, I am whatever my people need. I don't know what need you have here this morning. But please listen very carefully. I'm not just reading something. I'm reading something that's your lifeline for a miracle. If you'll only grab it. And to help us understand the heart of God, God has left a complete blank after his name so that man may bring as many needs as they arise to complete it. Hallelujah. It would not be an understatement to say that without human need, this great name of God goes round and round in an endlessly close circle. I am that I am, which makes God incomprehensible. But the moment human need and misery pres present themselves, he becomes just what that person needs. The verb at last has an object. The sentence is complete and God is revealed and known in all his intimacy. Do you need salvation from sins and eternal life? I am the way, the truth and the life. Do you need peace? Well, I am thy peace. Do you lack wisdom? I am thy wisdom and so on. The name I am is literally like a blank check. And your faith can fill in on the basis of your need. And the promises of his word as found in the Bible, what he is to be to you. My friend, God does not want you to fall by the wayside and perish. He wants you to know him as the great I am and live above the negative pressures and tensions of this world. I can half imagine a grin breaking across your sad face this very moment. You want to shout and dance for joy. Beloved, go ahead and just do it. God loves you. He wants you to rejoice in the revelation of who He is all day long. He wants you to know that He is entirely committed to your success and well-being. He is not a God of failure, although he takes failures like you and me and makes us like himself a success. God has a grand plan for your life, so don't settle for less. The God of the Bible, Jehovah, the great I am that I am, is the God of the sun, the moon, the stars and all of creation. He owns it all. And he has placed you and me in this world with a purpose. To rule and to reign as joint heirs with Christ on this earth. Till Jesus comes back again. Regardless of what it might be. If you will only stand for God when the moment of decision in your life arrives. The great I am that I am will not leave you nor forsake you. Things may be crumbling around you and falling. But if you are anchored with the great I am, all will be well with you and your house will stand and not fall. Now come back to John's Gospel chapter 9 please. Verse 5 is no longer a mystery to us. How do I understand what Jesus was teaching his disciples? Well, I understand it in the context of his usage of that two words. I am the light of the world. You want light? You want revelation? You want illumination? Don't run around from pillar to post trying to seek it out in mystery religions. Don't try to find your light and revelation in cultic movements. You will not find your illumination in even new age movements. You'll only find it in the one who said, I am the light of the world. Jesus. Look at Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 and 2 please. For a moment. How does the Bible read? It says, Arise shine. For thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold the darkness shall cover the earth. 
gross darkness the people but the lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee now in the world there is darkness but in jesus you see the light of the world now when you see the light of the world you begin to see things more clearly things you never understood become clearer to you now let's look at the miracle of jesus in verses 6 onwards when he had thus spoken he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him go wash in the pool of Siloam which is by interpretation sent he went his way therefore and washed and came seen now look at verse 6 this is one of the two miracles in which Jesus is said to have used spittle to effect a cure the other is a miracle that you will read of in Mark's gospel chapter 7 verse 33 the healing of a man who was deaf and who was a stammerer now I want you to see something so you will get this revelation into your spirit this morning look at verse 6 please when he had thus spoken he spat on the ground after he had declared his name light of the world what did i tell you a little earlier when light comes darkness is dispelled when light comes you begin to see what you never saw before after he had spoken the principle of speaking things into being has never changed you will read in genesis chapter 1 over and over and over again and god said 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 till you finally say you, you read and god saw so many times said 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 and then finally and god saw now look at jesus following the principle first declared the name of god i am and then what he expected to manifest in john's gospel chapter 9 verse 5 light of the world now in verse 6 the bible says he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle why genesis chapter 2 verse 7 you see yahweh doing something there man was formed of the dust of the earth the word formed it's the hebrew word yatsa y-a-t-s-a-r it literally means he was molded or squeezed as a potter does the clay before the clay is put on the wheel that spins round and round and an object comes out of that you know spinning wheel do you see the resemblance God the Father God the Son same works same works because the man was born blind from birth he was a blind man so like you see God the Father making man out of the dust of this earth the word dust is the Hebrew word apahar a-p-h-a-r apahar it really means mud now Jesus is spitting on the ground and making clay of the spittle how did God the Father accomplish it earlier just before you read in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 the Bible says the earth was watered with dew from on high nothing about Jesus is really a mystery when you have Jesus on the inside of you you begin to see what he wants you to see you begin to move towards where he wants you to be 
and you begin to have what he wants you to have. The Bible tells us that the Lord God caused a mist to water the whole face of the earth. The word the Lord God is Yahweh Elohim. Many believe that Yahweh Elohim is no one but a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now what did he do? He made clay of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. The word anointed means to spread the clay upon the eyes of the blind man. Spread it completely. Now I want you to see something. This was an unusual methodology Jesus adopted. But the man did not take offense. Nor should you. Most of the time we see people taking offense. Why? I thought he will come and lay his hands on me. I thought God will do it like this. Well what if he doesn't choose to do it like you think? The other day I was reading about how Billy Graham at one time wanted to start a radio ministry. So he called up all the main people he knew, people of wealth. He knew they could afford it, they were good believers. But somehow all the big wigs were already committed to some other project. And he was very discouraged. He was sitting there. He knew it was of God. He knew that God had a plan and a purpose. He, he needed, if I'm not mistaken, 25,000 US dollars to get the project going. And he didn't know what to do. When he heard the Spirit of God whisper something to him. You went after the big people in my kingdom. Now give the little ones a chance. Give the little ones a chance. A budget. And we'll know whether God is in it or not. If we only just give one dollar, we'll meet this expense. And the rest is history. They got $25,000. Exactly the amount. Radio ministry started. Give the little people a chance. Give God to do something in your life a little differently. Why do you assume he's only going to do it like this? He won't. His bigness is revealed in his answer. That he gave to David. He said, David, I have never dwelt in a house. What are you trying to do? Build a house for me. It's too small for me. If I descend in all my glory, you won't find a bit of your house. It will be blown to smithereens. You won't find anything there. I am too big for that. But, I will do something. I am Emmanuel. God with us and in us. Temporarily I will stay there. I will choose to place my name there. But it won't be forever and ever. It's going to be different when the Messiah comes. And thank God the Messiah came. Now think about the bigness of God. When he chooses in his sovereignty to say, I am indwelling the praises of my people. So your praises matter. Your worship matters. You are not here letting your eyes wander from pillar to post. Wanting to see how the place is. No, 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 no. You are keeping your eyes focused on him. Because in his goodness he is condescending. To say I will dwell where you praise me. You worship me. I will dwell there. I will be there. Now. Again you find. After Jesus had applied this. Clay. Mixture. On this man's eyes. In verse 70, the Bible says, And said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. Not once do you read from verse 1 till here that the man asked for healing. Not once do you see Jesus telling the man, Go wash, you will be healed. 
at least not in this place. He only told him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The word Siloam means scent. And I'm going to tell you why it meant scent. Now the water supply of Jerusalem, a little background behind this name, came mainly from the spring Gihon, which was situated in the Kidron Valley. Some of you someday will go and see it. Come back and tell us how it is. Now, this spring, which was situa situated in the Kidron Valley, was an unusual spring. There were 33 rock-cut steps that led down to it. That means it was below the level of the earth, blasted into rock. 33 rock-cut steps led to this place, the spring of Gihon, but it was an open spring. It was completely exposed and in the event of a siege could be completely cut off. Therefore, when King Hezekiah realized that King Sennacherib, the Assyrian was about to invade Palestine, he came to a conclusion that he would have to protect this spring because this was the sole supply of water for Jerusalem. So what did he do? He decided to cut through solid rock and tunnel through the rock, make a conduit from the spring into the city so that water from the spring could be sent into the city. That's why the word sent. Now what I'm talking to you about is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 32 verses 2 to 8 and then verse 30. 30. Isaiah chapter 22 verses 9 to 11 and 2 Kings chapter 20 verse 20. I'm repeating again. 2 Chronicles chapter 32 verses 2 to 8 and then verse 30. Isaiah chapter 22 verses 9 to 11 and 2 Kings chapter 20 verse 20. Now, I want you to see that even in the way in which this tunnel was made or this conduit was made, there was a miracle involved in the entire process. What was the miracle? If the engineers had cut straight through the rock, the distance from the spring to the city would have been a distance of 366 yards. But they didn't cut that way. They cut through the rock in a zigzag fashion. And the conduit measures 583 yards. But that's not the miracle. The miracle is this. With prayer and by faith, the engineers in King Hezekiah's time started cutting from both ends simultaneously. And the amazing part is, you heard it a little earlier, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by his spirit. Both the men who were cutting met at the same point. That's the miracle. That is what you'll read in the portion of scripture I told you. They heard the other man's voice. That's amazing. I mean, it'll make your hair stand up to follow such a God. He leads you in a zigzag way. You don't know where you're going, but you'll get to the right place if he's leading you. If he's leading, you'll get to the right place. Here is the one on whom the anointing was resting in a measure that nobody had ever experienced earlier. It would have been simple for him to say, be healed. He didn't. He said, go to Siloam. Go to that place which was sent. Go to the place where the power of God manifested so that the waters from the spring could flow into the city to sustain life. Go back to the waters. Go back to the waters. Go back to the power of God. Go back to the healing. Healing streams. Go back to the place where the presence and the glory of God rests. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the Bible says in verse 7, He went to ask his wife,
whether to do so. Is that found there? Well, that's what most people do. God speaks to them something, they want to go and ask someone else, must I do it? He didn't. He didn't take offense. He must have heard Jesus spit enough on the ground to make clay. What does it matter? As long as it's Jesus' spittle. What does it matter? As long as it is his method. The man didn't bother. He didn't take offense. He didn't get angry. He didn't pull away the clay from his eyes. The Bible says, He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. He went a blind man. He came back a seeing man. Went, washed, came. Now, verse 8. The neighbors therefore they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? They are not bothered about the miracle. They are not bothered about the works of God. They are not bothered that something spectacular had happened right before their eyes. What they are bothered about is... This man, a beggar, he lived off our goodness, indifference to the core. And that's how it is. You'll be bubbling over with laughter and joy at what the Lord has done. And they look at you and say, so what? So what? They don't know what it means for you to stand and to testify that the Lord is good. They don't know it. They're indifferent. They happen to be your neighbors. Verse 9. Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. The actual word, if you look at it, is there. Is he only said, I am. He didn't use the word he. The word he is written in italics, in running script. Verse 10. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? Now look at verse 9. Some are having a real problem. They are supposed to be his neighbors. Here's the man seeing. But you read the, the verse 9. Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. They will always be the ones to talk away the miracle that you experience from God. Never quit standing your ground and declaring, My life is a miracle. This is what the Lord did for me. This is what He showed me. This is what He did in my life. Now in verse 10, they are not asking to learn. They are asking with a different mindset. Let's read verse 11. He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. He repeats exactly what took place. But I want you to see something there. Remember earlier Jesus saw a man. Now this man is only seeing a man. A man called Jesus did something. There are many today will come for a gospel meeting. They'll hear... A man of God preach. And they'll go back seeing only the man. They don't see the anointing. They don't see the Messiah. They don't see beyond a point. We had a very, very powerful time the other day. It was awesome. Serving communion. In a particular house. The power of God was so strong. The presence of God. And at one point, I had to just sit down. And God took over from that point onwards. It's Him. Can I have Amen? It's Him. Who did you come to see? The pastor? You'll be disappointed. You got to see Him in all His glory. You got to see the one who's anointed in all His glory. But let's give it to the man. He just saw what he saw and explained it just like that. He didn't add, he didn't subtract. That's what a good testimony will be like. Just say it as it is. Don't increase. Don't make it flamboyant. Don't try to make it flowery. Don't try to make it even interesting. Just say it as it is. 
Let the Lord do the rest. Let him do the rest. Let's read. Now, a man that is called Jesus. There's a lot in that phrase. A man. Like the first man, Adam. This is the last Adam. Called Jesus or Yeshua, Savior, Redeemer. He made clay, anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go wash the word of command. And I obeyed and went and washed. And I received sight. So will you. If you'll only listen and obey. What is he talking to you? Listen. Hear. Clearly. And obey. You just don't do what you think. Not all the time do you receive revelation from the signs you see on the road. You got to know it's God speaking to you. Or else if you're con contemplating suicide and you're walking and you see a beautiful display board saying just do it you go crazy trying to attempt doing what you are thinking in your mind assuming this is God you don't learn from circumstances outside you hear from God on the inside he speaks to you he guides you but most often his words are words of command it propels you to do something. You either to accept it or reject it. There is no neutrality you can maintain. The other day I read something in the newslet, I mean newspapers about how the Roman Catholic Church is finally doing away with the place called Limbo. They need not have wasted centuries fighting over a something that was never in the Bible. All they had to do is come to the word. There's a heaven and a hell. I said there's a heaven and a hell. No halfway point. Point. No moving from one place to the other place. Through a process of refinement. You're either saved here or not saved here. You're either born again into the kingdom of God or you're still a sinner. If you're talking about life after death, well, you better ensure there is life after death while you live on planet earth. Or it's death after death process of dying where you're eternally separated from God you want life well you better make sure it's life you buy the ticket of life not by paying 20 rupees not by ensuring somebody will pray for you after you're dead no no no, no. while you live you accept Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior into your heart hallelujah all this is so important for us then said they unto him verse 12 where is he? He said, I know not. It's obvious Jesus was not standing in that same place. He must have moved on. But you got to also see something there. That's the general complaint of people. Where is he? I don't know, Pastor. What about the nine gifts of the Holy Ghost? Pastor, I don't know, Pastor. Do you believe that Jesus prospers? No, it's a pure cry of utter desperation what do you mean pastor I don't know pastor you better know ignorance is not bliss in God's kingdom where is he well that's the cry that was in the Magai when they came searching for Jesus where is he who was born king of the Jews the question is if you are eager to know where he is you'll find him the question is are you eager many are not they got their miracle they got their financial blessing they got their touch from the Lord well that's over finished I'm through the others said where is he he said I know not write it down ignorance it's not bliss. Now as a result of ignorance. See what happened. They brought to the Pharisees. Him that aforetime was blind. Now they want to check it out. And it was the Sabbath day. 
when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. <laughs> again and again. You find Jesus hounding these people on the Sabbath day to show them that as long as there is a sinner in need of salvation, God saves regardless of the day. As long as there's a man who needs healing, God heals regardless of the day. As long as there's one man sitting and crying out in utter despair, this God never takes a rest or a break. He's there to deliver. He's there to put you back on your feet. He's there to fight for you. He's there to show you things to come. We'll stop with that for now. But it must have made the Pharisees mad. We're going to continue this next week. They must have been mad. What do you mean? He made clay? And that you out of spittle? And you went? And you washed? And you came back seeing? Some will even keep you blind. They'll rather be happy that you're blind than for you to come to the lawgiver and receive sight. Because there's so much throwing the law on you. The do's and the don'ts. This entire chapter 9 is powerful. We're going to continue this next week and God willing we'll close these teachings on the eight outstanding healing miracles of Jesus next week. But I want you to know it's powerful. The development between belief and unbelief is powerful. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we're so glad that we're here this morning. So glad to know that the presence of God, the person of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, has been leading and guiding us right through the word and our worship and praise and this prayer time and intercession we have had, O oh Father. And even now we know that the blood of the covenant is upon us. The blood of the covenant. The blood that speaks of better things than the blood of Abel's dead. And it's on us by day and by night. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for every brother, every sister, every family, every child, every individual who's here this morning. We're grateful because your word never changes. You are still the great I am. And you want us to rise up and say what we want you to be to us. Savior, healer, redeemer, baptizer, coming king. Oh, hallelujah. Touch everyone in a special way. The other intercessors were not here for some reason, oh God. They are in work spots. Let the blood be upon them. Same blessing that we have. Let them experience. For we are one body. One body O oh Lord. Thank you Father. Lead us right into the. Week ahead with your blessing. And even now as we go back. We will go back rejoicing. For you are the God of signs. Wonders and miracles. The God of divine interventions. Thank you Father. Touch people in a very very special way. And lead us like you would do where still waters flow. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus.